Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for December 16th, 2018. Um, we are still in Unit 1 for the quarter, for the winter quarter, which is entitled, God Commands Our Love, Respect, and Obedience. And our, from the adult quarterly, the pathway faith pathway adult quarterly our lesson title is credit where credit is due our devotional reading is taken from psalms 86 verses 1 to 7 our background scripture psalms 103 verses 1 to 17 and verses 21 and 22 it happens to be one of my favorite songs of praise and um, we're going to read through our lesson text shortly but from the quarterly the lesson aims or consider the breath and death of God's care for us as expressed in Psalm 103 second aim appreciate how God has provided comfort in past times of trouble and number three respond to God's consolidation with worship and devotion the quarterly is uh, divided or has three major divisions after the introduction the first is titled making it personal and that's covered between Psalm 103 verses 1 to 5 the second is corporate worship and that's covered between verses 6 and 17 and then the last is all creation all creation that's covered between verses 21 and 22 from the standard commentary our lesson title is love and worship God love and worship God and additional aims are number one give the reasons for praising the Lord found in today's text from Psalm 103 and David this is a song of David and David gives reasons for praising God which we'll be discussing number two tell how these reasons apply to Christians living under Jesus's new covenant then number three compose a psalm to the Lord combining an acknowledgement of the Lord's character with an awareness of the blessings he has given amen and uh, the standard uh, lesson has uh, three major divisions as well the first is open opening exhortation covered between verses 1 and 5 the second God's character covered between verses 6 and 17 and the third closing exhortation verses 21 and 22 before we get into our our lesson uh, text before we read our lesson text let's just go to the the throne um, ask God's blessing on this lesson father we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word Lord we pray that you give us a clear understanding of your word Lord and how important it is to to praise you Lord from the depths of our heart because you're so deserving of our praise Lord Lord as we study your word Lord always increase our faith and as our faith is increased Lord increase our obedience to your word in Jesus name we pray amen all right we're going to just read through our lesson text in its entirety and then we'll back up and we'll have some verse by verse discussion um, so Psalm 103 beginning at verse 1 Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all 
that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And then we jump down to 21. Bless ye the Lord, all ye hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Okay, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Psalm 103 is uh, a psalm that was written by David, and it is a praise psalm. If you're familiar with the psalms, you know that uh, in the psalms, the writers express uh, the entire gamut of human emotions um, before God. Um, uh, they express distress and fear. They, they express, of course, uh, their concern about God's uh, un apparent unattentiveness to their needs. But they also express faith and, and praise. And in fact, there are several types of psalms uh, included uh, in the Bible, uh, which uh, include uh, hymns. I mean, they are actually hymns or or songs of thanksgiving, uh, songs of lament, uh, songs of of uh, wisdom. Uh, they're royal psalms. They're psalms. Uh, they're messianic psalms, and of course, uh, songs of praise. And this happens to be uh, one of the best. Uh, I believe one to be one of the uh, the, the most. Uh, um, the best uh, praise psalms uh, in the entire Bible. So let's jump in here at verse uh, 1, which reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And, and let me just say, David has uh, exper experienced a very close relationship with God. And of course, David has sinned. Uh, he's witnessed. He's experienced God's forgiveness. He's experienced God's mercy. He's experienced firsthand these things that he is praising uh, God for throughout this psalm. So he starts out with his personal praise to God and then moves to exhorting others to praise him as well and gives reasons for those praise. So in verse 1, he says, bless, and bless, of course, means uh, a couple of things in Scripture. You know, God blesses us. God gives us benefits. It means his benefits to us. Uh, when we bless God, it, it, it typically means we praise him. So another word for bless in this verse could be praise the Lord. O oh, my soul. Oh, my soul really means everything, the entirety of his being. He is uh, telling himself, he's basically instructing himself to praise the Lord with everything that's in him. And we can go back to, I think it was last week's lesson, or a couple of weeks ago, I guess, when we read the, from the Shema. We read the Shema and uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6. Uh, verse 5, 4 and 5, which is, Bless the Lord, O oh my... I mean, which really gives us the first commandment, which is for us to love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So this is... Uh, it kind of parallels that uh, command for us to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
David is basically saying that it commanding his soul or the entirety of his being to praise the Lord. And, and in this verse, we see uh, a familiar uh, writing style uh, of the psalmist, and that is to use parallelisms. Uh, he says two things in two different ways, uh, two different, slightly different expressions. Bless the Lord. And then he says, bless his holy name. And he says, oh, my, uh, he said, oh, my soul, which is, of course, again, the entirety of his being. But then he says the same thing and all that is within me. So those are couplets, if you will, in this parallelism in that verse. Now, so he is exhorted himself to bless the Lord. Now we move to verse two and it says, bless the Lord. O my soul, again, all that is within him, and forget not all of his benefits, all of his blessings. He's commanding his soul not to forget. And there's two ways of uh, looking at this. As I've studied this psalm over the years, uh, in one sense, you could, uh, you could uh, uh, understand it to mean don't forget his many benefits or all of them the number of them the entire number of them in another sense you can think of it as don't forget uh, all of his benefits as in remember some of them and I think uh, David is really meaning to not forget the many the multitude of his benefits when we praise the Lord we need to be uh, in remembrance of what God has done for us, his blessings, his his benefits to us. Uh, uh, we need to recall uh, how he's delivered us out of uh, all kinds of distressful situations, how he's provided for us abundantly, materially and spiritually. Uh, and, 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 and the Lord warns, uh, he actually, through Moses, commands the children to remember his blessings and warns them uh, about uh, what would happen if they forgot them. Uh, going back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm going to read very quickly verses 10 to 20. Uh, and, uh, and I think that will help us understand uh, what God thinks about us remembering his blessings and praising us for them. Uh, beginning at verse 10, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, When thou hast eaten and art full, then... Thou shalt bless the Lord, or praise the Lord thy God, for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, in not keeping his commandments, and his judgments, and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten, and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwell therein, and when that thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And I'll just cut off there. I'll just stop there. Uh, because he goes on to tell them reasons, to give them reasons for not forgetting how he's blessed them and how he's providing for them even in the wilderness at that point. Uh, let's go on to verse uh, 3. So verse 3 says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. So, so, so David has given a, a general statement not to forget all of God's benefits. And now he's going to list some specific benefits, some specific blessings of the Lord. Now, and it's worth noting that he mentions both spiritual blessings and material blessings. He says, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, all thy sins, and healeth all thy diseases. Of course, forgiving of the sins is a spiritual blessing. And healing diseases is a physical blessing. So this this is just an example of the blessings, the many blessings that God has provided. Uh, and God, of course, has the power to heal all diseases. Uh, and there's many, many examples 
of Jesus doing that, both forgiving sins and healing diseases. Uh, when you have a chance, uh, read Mark uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12 for an example of him forgiving sins and healing disease of a, a paralytic uh, brought to Jesus. Verse 4, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Again, more specific reasons for blessing. Uh, God redeems, which means to, to buy back our life from destruction, and that is not just physical destruction or physical death, but it's eternal damnation and eternal separation from God that, um, of course, is in store for all those who reject him and reject his son. And he says, so he redeems our life from destruction. And that's provided, of course, through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he crowns, uh, as if uh, as if we were royalty, us with loving kindness and tender mercies. And this speaks of his compassion, his his tender compassion for his children, those of us who are his children. Verse 5a, who satisfied thy mouth with good things. Now, that's, that's uh, you know, God blessing us materially. God certainly providing for all of our needs, but even going beyond our needs and providing us with many of the things that we want, simply because he delights in us. You know, the Lord delights in his children and wants to bless them with, with every good thing. Uh, part B of verse 5 says, So that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. And again, a specific blessing. How is the eagles' strength renewed or youth renewed? Many are not aware of this. I've happened to know how eagles renew their strength for some years now, and it's remarkable. Eagles can live up to 70 years. I mean, that's about as long as the average human uh, in many countries. But um, at, at about age 40, the eagle, uh, who was, of course, a symbol of strength, has been for, for generations, for for centuries, uh, will fly to, he, he will do either one of two things. Uh, he'll weaken and eventually die. Uh, his beak uh, gets uh, curved and he really cannot uh, uh, catch game and his, his talents get dull and he cannot catch game the way he used to. His feathers get so thick that uh, uh, they stick to his uh, his breast and he cannot fly that well. And so what the eagle does is flies uh, to a high mountain and, and, and gets in the, cre the, 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 the crevice of, a, of the rock face or a high tree on a mountain, builds a nest. And the, and the eagle will take his beak, uh, usually, again, he'll beat the beak against the rock until he basically breaks it off. And the, and the beak re, uh, grows, he grows a new beak. And of course, this is a sharp beak that's not, uh, not curved uh, as the old one was and weakened as the old one was. And then uh, he uses that new beak to pluck out his talons. And then the, the talons regrow. And as the, after the talons regrow, of course, he, he uses the talons and the beak to pluck out the feathers. He plucks out his feathers, and then he waits. He waits in the, crep, in, the, in the cleft of a rock until he is renewed. And the, uh, the, 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 the feathers grow back, and he soars off that mountain with new strength to live another 30 years. That is how the eagle's strength is renewed. And what David is saying is God can renew our strength just as he renews the eagle's strength. Now, he could be talking both spiritually and physically at this point, but I'm, I'm inclined to think that he's talking about a spiritual renewal that, uh, that, that compares to how the eagle is renewed. Uh, 
So let's go on to verse 6. Now we're going to begin to speak about God's character. Verse 6, the Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Now, the Lord uh, is righteous, the Lord is just, and the Lord is very concerned, and, and, and he actually expresses his concern throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, for the weak among us, the widows and the orphans, those who, and the poor, those who are uh, taken advantage of very often by the rich and powerful because they have no power and they have no advocate someone that will defend their cause. Uh, we can read about uh, God's commandments regarding the, the, the care for the poor and, the, and the, the, the widows and the orphans in Exodus 23, verse 3, and then 6 and 9, Deuteronomy 24, uh, and this is more appropriate, Deuteronomy 24, verses 17 to 22. And, of course, Isaiah makes mention of uh, how um, the uh, those who are weak, those who are um, again uh, at a disadvantage because of their uh, they lack power. Uh, in uh, in fact, I'll I'm going to read uh, from Isaiah 1:17 and then uh, 23. So Isaiah 1:17 says, "Learn to do well, seek judgment." Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And jumping down to verse 23, it says, Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. So, again, God chastises and uh, criticizes those who are powerful for not looking after and protecting the interests and the rights of the poor and the weak. Jesus has a lot to say about um, uh, us having compassion or those who are in uh, positions of power having compassion on the poor and the disadvantaged. Uh, you can read about that in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. And in that passage, uh, Jesus has come with all his angels. He's sitting on his throne of glory, and he's got all the nations. He's bringing all the nations before him, and he's separating them as a shepherd separates the sheep uh, from the goat. He's putting the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left hand. And he says, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom which was prepared for you before the foundation of the world. That's verse 34. And he says, He was hungry, and, and, and you gave me meat. He was thirsty, and you gave me drink. He was naked, and you clothed me. He was in prison, you visited me, and so forth. And then the righteous says, When did we do these things? And he said, In verse 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, As much as ye have done this unto the unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Then shall he say to them on the left, Depart from me, uh, ye cursed, unto everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. James also, uh, in chapter 1, verse 27, has something to say about the care for the, the poor. Let's go on verse 7, uh, which reads, And made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Now again, uh, what David is doing is listing specific uh, blessings uh, that God has provided. And when, when it says he made known his ways unto Moses, he made himself known to Moses. He made his law known to Moses. And through Moses, of course, uh, he showed his powerful acts, his acts of judgment on Israel, his parting of the Red Sea, see his provisions of food and, and, uh, uh, and, and everything needed in the wilderness while they sojourned there for 40 years. And so, uh, unlike the, uh, the, the pagan uh, religions, uh, 
where the worshipers are were often groping and guessing as to what the deities desired, God made himself known, made his desires known, made his uh, law, his standards known to Moses, and of course through Moses to the children of Israel. And all the words of the law uh, that, that he gave him, read Deuteronomy 29, 29. Verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. This is something that David knows firsthand, and we should all know this. Uh, we know that God is, is compassionate. Uh, God is merciful, which means he does not give us the due punishment that we deserve. He's gracious. He gives us what we don't deserve, what we're not deserving of, even our salvation. We're not deserving of that. And he's slow to anger. God is patient with us. God doesn't settle our accounts the moment we sin. God gives us time to repent and to confess sin. And it says he's plenteous in mercy, plenteous in love, plenteous in compassion. He is, in fact, uh, we know in Hebrews he's called love. God is love. Uh, verse 9a says, he will not always chide. This word chide comes from a Hebrew word, which means uh, accuse. He will not always be accusing or bring a, bring a case before us or bring a case to court. Uh, and we know the real accuser is Satan himself. You know, Satan tries to accuse the brother. Okay. Part B of uh, verse 9 says, Neither will he keep his anger forever. Um, you know, let, let's, let's talk for just a minute about God's anger. God's anger is not like man's anger. Uh, man's anger uh, can be angered with uh, all, all types of impure motives um, uh, and, and unjustifiably angry at times. But, but God, and in fact, uh, James uh, one twenty says that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Uh, our anger is often misplaced and unjustified, but God does not have a smoldering, lingering anger uh, that basically is caused by um, uh, some unjustifiable uh, per, uh, by something unjustifiable. God is primarily angry against sin. I mean, God is angered by the sin against him, the sin that we commit. Uh, and, uh, his and our response to his, uh, his graciousness, to his blessings, uh, those things anger God. And God is certainly justified in his anger. But his anger will not last forever. His anger is certainly always under his control and certainly tempered by his, his loving kindness and his tender mercy. And those of us who, are, uh, who have intimate relationships with God know this very well. We know how God has, uh, has been merciful to us even when we deserve his anger. Verse 10, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. Uh, again, God does not deal with us uh, because of his mercy according to our sins. Mercy means uh, uh, him not giving us the punishment that we deserve. Grace is the other side of that same coin, which means he gives us what we don't deserve or it's unmerited favor. So we have sinned countless times before God. And if God had done had not been merciful, we'd have, we would have been judged for every sin. And we would have been rewarded with our due reward, which was punishment of some sort. Even those who name the name of Christ, we know when we sin, we break fellowship with God. And, and by rights, 
our Father can take us to the woodshed and punish us for those sins. But God is merciful and gracious uh, to his children uh, and, and is, again, not slow uh, to judgment or judge or punishment, if you said, if as I said. And then it says, according to our iniquities. Again, that's another parallelism. He could not dealt with us after our sins, okay, nor rewarded us according to our iniquity, which basically mean the same thing. It's a little couplet there, which is a Hebrew Hebrew writing style or technique. Let's take verses 11 and 12 together. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Now, what David is trying to describe here is the degree to which uh, God uh, has been merciful to us. Uh, so, and, and actually, he's using hyperbolic language here. As as high as the heaven is above the earth, I mean, that's a tremendous height. So great is His mercy towards us. I mean, it's 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 overabundant, in other words. And then he says, as far as the east is from the west. Well, how far is the east from the west? The east never meets the west. I mean, you can circumnavigate the globe countless times uh, just going east or going west and never have to stop. You can go around the world countless times going east or west and never have to stop. The east never meets the west. Uh, if you were going from pole to pole, you go from the you could go from the South Pole to the North Pole and then south back to the South Pole. But you're always going you're going either north or south. But in the case of going east or west, you can go either direction and circumnavigate the globe or completely go around the globe. And what he's saying is that's how far. And again, it's hyperbolic language. He's removed our transgressions from us and against transgressions is a type of offense a type of violation of God's law uh, verse 13 now this speaks of the Lord's compassion like uh, how compassionate he is like as a father pitieth his children so the Lord pitieth them that fear him now in the Old Testament it was not common for the Hebrews to look at God as a as a father uh, that was uh, too intimate. That would suggest that they were of the same nature. And uh, but here we see that more in the, in the New Testament, of course. And of course, as Peter says, we are partakers of the divine nature through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we know that we are the adopted children of God, our Father. But as any father, any decent father, pity, pities his children. Uh, so our Father, our perfect Father, pities us. And it says that fear him. We've talked about this word fear, which is from the Hebrew word yer. And uh, it it really takes on the full meaning based on the context. Uh, it's, it does mean reverence in many cases, to reverence him or reverence our Father. But it can also mean to dread, to be to be terrified of. And there's a combination, it can mean both uh, in the same passage, as I think it does here. And I've given examples in, in my class uh, on Sundays of how, of how uh, we see this in our own parents. Uh, if we have a father uh, that, disciplines, that disciplined us when uh, we were uh, out of line, when we disobeyed, uh, certainly we reverenced him, we respected him. But we also feared judgment. We also feared punishment if uh, we disobeyed. And, and very often we disobeyed several times before that capital punishment, if you will, or corporal punishment, if you will, actually came. Uh, verse 14, for he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Now, as creator, God knows that we how he put us together i mean we're we're just dust all the elements in our body you can find in dirt it's common dirt for the most part you can read about that in genesis 2 7 it describes how god formed man of the dust god remembers we are weak i mean we are 
bags of dust, as our former pastor used to say. And so he, uh, uh, this is a reason for uh, his sympathy and his patience with us. Uh, verse uh, 15 and 16. As for man, his days are as grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. Now, in these verses, David is beginning to make a comparison uh, uh, between the temporal nat nature of man. In other words, the, the temporary nature, nature of man and his existence, certainly mortal existence here on earth, and God's mercy. Okay, so he says, as for man, the days, all the days of our lives are like grass. I mean, grass is is very um, transitory, if you will, you know, and flowers are very transitory. He says, yeah, they flourish. I mean, in, and in the whole uh, spectrum of time, uh, just for a, 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 a moment, uh, and they're beautiful. They can be, but... Uh, again, you get a, a, some hot weather in the summer, you get some hot wind, and before you know it, the flowers are withered, the grass is, is dead, and, and they fade away. And, uh, and, and we also see in, in Isaiah where uh, God compares uh, the, uh, the, the uh, grass withers and the, the flower fadeth, but the word of, he compares the transitory nature of man to his word, which stands forever. Uh, verse 17a, but the mercy of the Lord in comparison to the temporary, very temporary nature of man and the existence of man on this side of eternity, but the mercy of the Lord is forever, is from rather, rather everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. In other words, it has no end uh, to those who, again, fear him, who reverence him, but I think, again, also dread a punishment and dread chastisement or disciplining uh, when we continue in sin. So certainly we reverence him, those who reverence the Lord. Okay, so we are... Um in the last section of the outline um, in the quarterly as well, which is entitled All Creation, All Creation, and again, um, and from the standard closing exhortation, verse 21, Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Now, we skipped over uh, verse 20. Our lesson text does not include verse 20. Actually, uh, doesn't include 17b, 18, 19, and 20. And I like to just read those because, I mean, I think they're important parts of the praise as well. So 17 in its entirety reads, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. Verse 19, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Verse 20, bless the Lord, ye angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. And again, verse 21, bless ye the Lord, all ye hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Now, this is actually rising to a crescendo where David is exhorting all of God's creation to praise him. Again, this word bless means to praise him. We can't do anything, give the Lord anything. Everything belongs to him already, so we can't bless him in the sense that he blesses us he he provides benefits for us but we can praise him okay and he's saying praise all the lord all ye hosts and hosts are multitudes uh ministers and they, they're these are categories of of groups uh, uh of his of his those who serve him 
uh, and then that do his pleasure. Those who are actually believers, certainly, and his children, uh, those who reverence him, those who have accepted uh, him, uh, the Lord Jesus, as personal savior. Uh, we are all to praise the Lord. And David has given just a few reasons for those for, for for us to praise him in the preceding verses. And then finally, verse 22 says, Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, all of his works means all of his creation. I mean, uh, uh, anything that you can think of that was created, which is any, everything except for God himself, He's talking about animals, he's talking about people, he's talking about plants. Everything that he's created should praise the Lord, all of his works. His dominion, well, how far does his dominion extend? His dominion is over all, certainly all of his creation and all that exists. And again, he, he, he comes back full circle to his own personal uh, exhortation to himself. And that is to praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And that is all that is within me, the entirety of my being, I'm exhorting to praise the Lord. Now, uh, it should go without saying, uh, this should be something that we do daily. We should recognize the many benefits of the Lord. And, you know, we couldn't count them if we were to try. But we're certainly to recognize the abundance of God's grace and mercy uh, to uh, to us, toward us every day, and toward those that we love and care for, uh, and we are to praise Him from the depths of our heart for His love, grace, and mercy. And I pray that uh, you have uh, been inspired uh, to uh, to be more diligent in your praise of the Lord. May God bless and keep you.